Hi again, Physics 132. In class, I promised you a couple of videos this weekend, and one of them was about the problem I went over very, very quickly in class that I called motional EMF. When this came up, we had already solved for the magnetic fields uh, with both Ampere's law and the Biot-Savart law, so we knew about how to get magnetic fields. I don't need that here, but it was a, an important piece of the background. I actually, before that, had talked about the Lorentz force, and that is the force on a moving charge or a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. We had conceptually introduced motors and generators by using the Lorentz force, and in fact laid a lot of background for Faraday's law. In fact, just before this came up, we had formally stated Faraday's law. Uh, in spring 2012, that was day 33, most of the day was on uh, solving for magnetic fields and introducing inductance. Uh, you can go look up the file for that day and find more detail on the context, or look even the day before. When I did this problem, I tried to accent that there are two different ways to look at it. One of them, the typical one, uses Faraday's law. This is the formal statement with an integral, it includes Lenz's law. It's a way to look at the whole system. It's got the path integral on a closed path of the electric field, and that's equal to the opposite, the negative, of the time rate of change of the magnetic flux. And you had to remember what magnetic flux was. It, like electric flux or any other flux, is the dot product of the area and the field value. The other way to look at this was with the Lorentz force formula, which can get the same result. You look at the force on charges with a particular speed moving through a magnetic field, and the force is the value of the charge times the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field. That formula can also be recast by looking at currents and current carrying wires in a magnetic field. This version will come up later in the problem I have, but isn't the way you derive what's going on in the first place. The problem, called motional EMF, and it's one of those where I just laid it out with a what happens, has a uniform magnetic field with two wire rails perpendicular to it. I did not draw a picture when I stated this problem. One end of the rails is electrically connected with a resistor, and a conducting rod is free to slide along the rails. I push, or I often say pull, the rod away from the resistor. So the final picture is in the top right corner now, but again, I was trying to encourage you to think about how to draw the picture when you start a problem. When I draw the picture, as usual, I use the magnetic field vectors as these arrows pointing into the board or into the screen right now. My rails are thick lines on this picture. I have the resistor between them. I put a blue line across it for the rod that I will pull or push away from the resistor. And if I'm gonna talk about away, I need to put an axis, I call it X. When I pull or push the rod away from the resistor, I have positive charges moving with the force that is along to the right in this picture. I don't care what the real charge carriers are in the rod because my convention is to call current the direction of the positive charge carriers that are equivalent to whatever real current I have. So when I look at Q, V, cross B, the Lorentz force formula, I have V along that force to the right, B into the page. Use your right hand. The right hand rule tells you that along that rod, positive charges will want to move upward. Up on the page means that there is a counterclockwise current flowing around this loop. The loop, again, 
up along the rod, back along the top rail, down through the resistor, and out through the bottom rail. Current can only flow when you have a circuit, a loop, so it flows around in that direction. As it flows that way, now I've got a current going up and down, up in that rod. That means that there will be a force on it due to the magnetic field, so it makes the situation more complicated. As I pull to the right, there is a force due to the magnetic field. In which direction? Well, the current goes up, the field goes into the page, so the force goes to the left. It opposes the force with which I pull. How much? Well, if you knew the details of how charges move in that rod around the rails and through the resistor, you could calculate it. So the Lorentz force formula could solve this problem. But if you don't know all those details, it's easier to look at this with Faraday's law, where we look at the whole system. The whole system talks about magnetic flux in an enclosed loop. So the loop that is the only loop in the system sorry the only loop in the system is following around with the current technical glitch there. I won't re-record this though. I want to do it in one take. The loop is following the current. It is getting bigger. d phi dt, the time derivative of flux, appears in the Faraday's Law formula. So that's what we're going to look at when we do the math, because we know about macroscopic properties like resistance and current. So when we do the algebra, we use Faraday's law. We start out by writing the flux. The flux is just the area times the field times the cosine of the angle between that area and that field. But if the rails are perpendicular to the field, that cosine of an angle is 1, because the area vector is parallel to the field. So if area of a rectangle times strength of the field. And I called the distance between the rails L. And I called the distance the rod was from the resistor X. The electromotive force then is minus B times L times the time derivative of X. X was the only variable that changed in time. And the minus sign is from Faraday's law. It's the one that reflects Lenz's law. Since the only resistance in this circuit is R, the resistor, I can get the current from Ohm's law really easily. It's just that EMF, that voltage, divided by R. Then I set out to look for some other properties. By the way, if someone were testing you, they would probably ask directly about what that EMF or that current was first, and then ask about things like the force or energy conservation. The Lorentz force, the force due to the magnetic field on the wire, depends on the cosine of the angle between, but they're perpendicular, the field and the wire. So it's just I times the length of that wire, the only moving piece, the only piece that really matters is the, the rod that I pull. So I have I times L times B. And if I take the current on the line just above it and plug that in, I get square of the field value, square of the length of that rail, times the speed of the rail over the resistance. Another good question in its own right. But now I wanted to look at energy conservation, so I want to look at power balance. If I have constant speed, so a particular situation, not claiming that's the only way it could be, it's just the only thing I asked about. I want to balance the forces. To get constant speed, I need equilibrium. The external force is the force provided by the magnetic field, the Lorentz force on the wire. And the power I've provided is that value of force times the speed. 
Well, if I take that F sub B from the formula above it on the page now, I find that I get the square of the voltage over resistance. Well, V squared over R was one of the formulas we had for power in a circuit if it only had resistors in it, which this does. So the power in the resistor, the electric power, that's eventually dissipated as heat, that's equal to the power I put in. So energy is conserved. You should not be surprised at that. I am providing energy mechanically by pulling. Lenz's law tells me that there's an EMF that opposes that. It creates a current, which is electrical power, gives electrical power in the circuit, and eventually it's dissipated as heat. But the energy has to go somewhere. So this was the way I stated the problem. This is the way I dealt with the problem. You should be interested now, with a test coming up, about variations on the problem. I can formally state Lenz's law, as I did in class. You read it then. You can read it again. But if I want simple variations, the simplest ones are to throw in irrelevant information, which you know I love to do, or to ask other questions about the output. I could also vary the angle between the field and the frame. That gives you an extra cosine theta term in the calculation of flux. I could change the geometry of the frame. It doesn't have to be a rectangle. Actually sounds like a nice option to me. I could make the field change in time instead of moving a piece of the frame. It's time derivative of flux. So field times area is what matters. Uh, I do note there are other variations. I could make things more complicated by saying uh, the field is variable in space. Uh, sounds like a good problem, maybe a little hard for a test. Uh, I could make the geometry really non-trivial. Uh, I don't know how offhand, but that could be a good test problem. It's probably a little too hard. Or I could change both the field and the geometry in time. Honestly, that sounds too hard to grade for a test, but it makes for a good problem, and it might be more realistic. Uh, no matter what I do, there are a lot of variations. I did tell you in class that I really like this problem and haven't used it on a test in a while, but I think it's a good test problem. Hint, hint. Really, though, the problem shouldn't have been as hard as you thought it was. So, good luck with it. Have fun.